switch over to my screen in just a minute. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. I, I'm um, uh, hoping that that will uh, further um, further enhance the numbers here uh, in in terms of uh, people joining. But um, there is uh, a lot of material, and I I want to uh, apologize for not um, uh, having uh, many recent sessions for this. Uh, it's um, it's been a most unusual time in terms of uh, my other obligations, partly because of uh, the sort of prominence uh, into work uh, into which our work has been uh, thrust, and um, and the demand for uh, a lot of talks coming out of that. Um, so uh, between that and and marking and uh, a variety of other miscellany. Um, the things have been squeezed, but I'm hoping to, you know, keep keep this up uh, through a bunch of weeks working around uh, the boot camp and a bit of vacation I'll be taking um, the uh, next week. Um, now today's discussion is uh, a fun one, um, at least by my definition of fun, um, in the sense that it um, it, it builds on materials that we, um, we've covered uh, in previous uh, sessions of this uh, discussion group, but we've, um, uh, where, where we're gonna be looking at it from a slightly different angle, different combinations, but it really weaves together aspects of um, monads, um, adjunctions, uh, monoids and the, the category of of endofunctors, uh, but turns them all um, uh, from a different angle. And, and in many of cases, it turns them upside down. Um, I, I, I uh, was reminded of uh, my trips to Australia where um, everything seems uh, backwards and upside down in, in a certain strange sense. Uh, at once familiar yet so unfamiliar. Um, uh, my uh, sense of direction was is exactly opposite. I have a pretty strong sense of direction. Um, uh, I understand there's some basis of that in physiology, but um, but in Australia it's like exactly reversed. Um, my sense of where the ocean is is precisely uh, 180 degrees uh, off off base. Um, more than that, um, you know, where I'm used to seeing deer, there are kangaroos, <laughs> and um, there's uh, sort of a wholesale um, uh, shift in the ecosystems from one set of species with which I'm familiar to another, whether it's uh, flora or fauna. Um, and uh, again, everything looks at a certain high level, very similar but at a certain low level, totally different and reversed uh, in a strange way. And I feel that this holds pretty well for comonads. Um, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of things immediately recognizable and a lot of things completely reversed in a, in a rigorous sense uh, from things that, that, that we've seen before with monads. Um, but it extends to, you know, the various uh, views of monads. Um, monads in the context of adjunctions, a relationship to adjunctions. Every adjunction gives rise to a monad. It also gives rise to a comonad, and the two are kind of opposite each other. One's matter, one's antimatter, in some weird sense. Um, the um, not a perfect analogy, but it's uh, it gives a sense of the duality. Um, same thing with things like uh, monads being uh, monoids in the category of endofunctors, um, where comonads are comonoids in the category of endofunctors. Um, and uh, some things there are the same. Um, so composition of endofunctors is what constitutes monoidal product for endofunctors, but they, um, uh, we have strange things like instead of multiplying two values to get back another value, we take that, that other value and produce two values, like a pair of two values. 
or a composition of two values from it. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a strange inversion of our normal senses of intuition that you may have built up. And in that sense, it's a lot of fun. Um, I have to confess, I was up last night at uh, till 2 a.m. Uh, pulling together these slides, but uh, the slides were greatly um, aided by uh, the fact that um, I could take slides in, in many cases, not all, but in many, I could take slides for monads and I could systematically adjust them in a way that was at once uh, a dramatic readjustment and on the other hand, a um, systematic kind of straightforward follow your nose sort of um, uh, tweaking. Uh, I kind of mapped a, a change over the entire um, space to get to get it for comonads. And, and it works amazingly well. Um, and there's a certain beauty that comes out. And so, you know, in, in this, um, this lecture, which we'll probably have to, we'll probably the, the second part of it offered later, because I came up with a, a very large number of, of slides, but a lot of them are things we've seen before. It's kind of, remember this for monads? Here we have the corresponding thing for comonads. And by going through that exercise, you can develop a lot of intuitions for what's going on, what's the same, what's different, what's systematically reversed, what regularities are preserved. And so that's our exercise for today. Um, and uh, with that uh, preamble, I'd like to, um, to switch over to uh, the slides here. Um, can you see my slides okay? I know Alex's um, uh, microphone is having trouble. Can you see the slides, Wade? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to uh, seek to cover uh, a variety of topics here um, that tie together comonads with uh, things which we with which we are familiar. Um, uh, and one thing is a little bit of motivations and a and a glimpse of kind of different ways of defining them. Um, uh, had in my druthers, I'd, I'd further uh, strengthen some elements, but I'll, I'll make some verbal comments there to supplement the, the actual slides. Uh, when we first introduced adjunctions, I said one of the reasons I like adjunctions is they're kind of the watering hole, just like watering holes of a savanna draw animals from all around the savanna, and you can learn a lot about that ecosystem by watching them. Adjunctions are kind of like that. They, they bring together a whole bunch of, of concepts and you can use them as a point of reference to learn about a lot of concepts. And, and comonads uh, most firmly fit within that rubric. So um, uh, comonads um, uh, within the adjunction context emerge as endofunctors uh, from adjunctions just as do co as monads, but they, um, uh, th they're dual. To, uh, to the endofunctors for monads. Both emerge in kind of a, a, a way that is kind of anti-symmetric to one another. Um, and uh, we'll go through a reminder of what that looks like for monads and what that looks like for comonads. And we'll see how uh, unit um, or eta uh, in monads uh, pops out. Um, we're guaranteed to have an eta. Uh, and we're guaranteed to have an epsilon or co-unit um, for the, so eight unit is, is eta for the monad and, and co-unit is epsilon for the co-monad. Um, we'll also see this construct called a co kleisley category. Um, we saw that Kleisley categories um, could, be, uh, could be amongst other things constructed in adjunctions from any monad um, and uh, they provide a, a useful way for thinking about one of the greatest features of the monad, which is the, the capacity to compose effectful computation, and to take two successive, uh, uh, two successive functions that uh, both produce effectful values from sort of naked values, as it were, and, and compose them together. Um, Co uh, and, and that's Kleisley categories. co Kleisley categories allow us to do composition as well, but it's composition of, of contextual computation, things that take values in a, a context and, and produce a raw value. Um, and uh, 
there's a co category associated with this that emerges from an adjunction and which um, formalizes this, this notion of, of composition and, and fits the co-unit into it much as the Kleisic category fits the unit as, as, uh, as the identity for composition, the co classic category is co-unit as identity for, for composition. Um, and uh, as time allows, um, we will, uh, well, we'll be looking at this, this issue of uh, how, um, just as we examined how join or, or mu, um, this kind of multiplication um, uh, works together with eta or unit on the monad side, we'll take a look at um, how Delta or duplicate interacts with the co-unit in the form of extend, or excuse me, in the form of extract um, or epsilon uh, in the case of comonads. Um, and uh, as time allows, we'll see that comonads um, are none, none other than comonoids in the category of endofunctors, much as monads are monoids in the category of endofunctors. Um, and um, we'll, we'll hopefully see a little bit of intuition about how co-unit and duplicate um, uh, interact uh, in this sort of way. Um, okay, so just to situate us, um, this should be pretty familiar, but um, we, uh, we have a pseudo or quasi category of Hask, which um, is going to be for most of our examples, our reference category, because we're we're operating uh, on uh, a category where the objects are types and the uh, morphisms are functions uh, from one type to the other, uh, or actually from a type to itself. Um, so it might be an is even function, for example, from int to bool that says whether each int is even, uh, and that's a, a morphism in this category, whereas the objects are, are bool and int, the set of uh, bools and the set of ints. Um, so uh, we're gonna be operating with respect to this, bearing in mind that these objects include both sort of built-in types, raw built-in types, uh, things like bools, doubles, floats, et cetera, as well as you know composite types or, or compound types. Um, uh, things that might be, um, might be, for example, uh, lists or, or things that might be tuples or things that might be um, monads applied to these. So maybe a integer or what have you. Um, and uh, even things like function, function types. This is a closed category. So function types are, are part of it. There are objects in this category. There's an object for, for the, um, types associated with each morphism. Um, okay, so that's our, our, our reference as it was before. Um, now, um, uh, before when we were dealing with uh, monads, I gave, I tried to lend some motivation to, um, uh, for how these are built up um, from a category theoretic perspective by noting that, you know, we have these functors which map from one they map every every type, so every object, uh, into some object. Um, could be the same object, could be uh, a different object. So maybe it maps bools to lists of bools and floats to list of floats, for example, and doubles to list of doubles. Um, that would be a, a list um, functor, um, which we'll see soon enough is is a list monad and. Uh, in general, you know, we can we can extend values with computational effects or generalizations of those values, um, embellishments of those values using using a functor. It's a, it's a simple functor, and we uh, we saw that uh, from the start um, of of this uh, discussion group that you know we can we can use functors in this sort of way, uh, and so we might have a list functor or we might have uh, a functor that tuples it with uh, you know a particular other type um, or that uh, turns it into a 
a value taking an element of of, of that type or or what have you. I think that would be contravariant. Um, uh, yes. Um, in any case, um, so functors can be used to elaborate values to to elaborate them with computational effects. Uh, well, it turns out by the same token, you could extend values in the same embellished way to, to offer context, right? We, we could map a, um, an int to a stream of ints. We could map um, a, uh, in, a double to a grid of doubles, for example. Um, and we could map a given type bool to a pair of bool and a string, for example. Um, so <clears throat> it's the same basic idea. In, in one case, we might prefer to think of it as a, as a computational effect that we'll be using. In other case, we might think of it as having a context, like we give the, the context uh, for a, a, a grid relative to some, some reference point. Um, but uh, ultimately, there are embellished values. Um, and with monads, our, our attention then became these functions that return these extended or embellished or generalized uh, or uh, values, or these values that also characterize some computational effects. Um, we realized that, look, if we want to signal, you know, no value has been computed, um, that there was, you know, an error or an exception or what have you, we could not just return an int, but we could return a, you know, int or a, a single value that indicates failure. Um, and so we had the, the, ooh, the maybe monad, uh, for example, um, that, uh, that came out of that, um, that inspiration. Or maybe we wanna say it's either this or an error message. Um, and uh, we had the either, the either functor, which became the either a uh, monad. Um, so, so we had that with, with effectful computations that we wanted to take uh, advantage of functions like this and ultimately be able to compose them nicely. Uh, with comonads, we have kind of a, the flip of that need. We're, we're interested in values that operate uh, on functions that operate on contextualized values. Instead of just operating it into, we want a stream events where it has some head and then there's the rest of the stream or we have a grid of these things and, and uh, we, have, we have some point of focus and we have a, uh, a broader grid around us. Um, or we have, as you saw in one of the videos, a zipper uh, where there's things to our left and things to our right. We have some neighborhood, there's a, a focal point again and uh, we want to be able to, to you know, reason about functions of this sort that don't just operate in, on an int by itself, but a generalization of it, a, a, a cont an inting context uh, in the context of a grid, the center point of a grid, or in the context of a location in a stream, or in the context of a location in a two-dimensional stream, or a sort of two-way stream like a zipper or what have you. Um, uh, okay, so um, you know we can we can have this generality. This should say this. This is uh, inherited uh, too late in the evening, um, and uh, by taking these elaborated values of type B, uh, we can capture a greater set of behaviors of this function. Yeah. Okay. That that still holds true. Um, uh, and uh, no, this is no longer returning. It's taking. Okay. Um, uh, a value extended with the functor. There we go. Um, sorry, that should have occurred at two thirty. Um, okay, so um, you know uh, where we have a value like this. We where we once had a value from A to B. We we'd like to now have a value that that kind of generalizes that or is taking these values of type A in context or in the in, in, a, in a certain um, neighborhood, perhaps. Um, so we'd like to take a pair of, uh, not just A by itself, but A and, and some environment in which to, maybe it's a symbol table to look up some, some values or 
it's uh, provide some other information to to disambiguate things. It's always the same or what have you. Or maybe we want to something that doesn't just take an A, but a stream of A's and does some things with them. Or we have a grid. Um, uh, we have an attributed tree uh, or a zipper of some traversable um, data structure that allows us to go different directions, whether it's a, a tree or a list or what have you. Um, so uh, here, all of these share the fact they're not merely compound structures, but they have some point of focus. So a stream as kind of a current position in a stream, a grid as is centered at a point. Um, this pair has, well, it has a, a value in the context of some fixed information. So it's a little bit less kind of nice, but it's uh, or nice analogy of a, of a neighborhood, but it's kind of the, the point of focus again. So all of these have points of, of focus. Um, and you saw that for the example, which I really liked of the game of life, uh, from Elias Jordan, um, also referenced by Bartosz Mielewski. Um, what we might have is, uh, is a, a grid centered at a point or a neighborhood uh, centered at a point. Um, a surrounding context centered you know, at, a, at a particular point. It has a focus. Um, now, uh, functors, provide this nice mechanism, uh, but they don't automatically provide a means of composing uh, these sort of, of functions. If we, if we have these functions which operate like this, functors by themselves can allow us to lift a function from A to B to be a function from F of A to F of B. But if we have these functions that we'd like to define, like saying square root cannot return a value for a negative uh, input and therefore it can return nothing. Um, we, we don't have a way to, to compose these really nicely if we have A to F of B and B to F of C. We'd like to compose it to be A to F of C, but uh, a functor does not directly provide that functionality. It's, it's not something uh, built into it. Um, and, and the same thing is true with these functions taking contextualized values. You know, if we have these sort of functions, um, we had a function from stream of A to A, and then we have another function from stream of A to A. We'd like to be able to, in some sense, compose them. Um, we, we don't have a nice, uh, nice way to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this pose, pose problems. Um, we, we, saw that functors could get us part of the way there with uh, monads, oh, sorry, with in the context of these effectful functions. So in the monad context, we looked at, at these sort of things. And we saw that, look, if, if we have a, a function a to f of b and, and another function b to f of c, we'd like to compose them to, to have a function from a to f of c. So if we write this one at, for f and this one for g, We'd like to be able to kind of stick them together in, in some nice way, uh, recognizing that, hey, if we know how to turn Bs into F of Cs, each of these Bs and the F of B, we should be able to operate on with that function. We'd like to be able to function, get a function out from A to F of C. And we could almost get there with a, um, uh, with a functor by uh, lifting G uh, to operate uh, with F. So if we lift G with F, we, we, uh, we apply the functor to G, then it, instead of going from B to F of C, it's going from F of B to F of F of C. Um, but you know, it's, it's taken F of B and, and that's what F gives us. So if, if we have F, it produces an F of B, great. And now we can consume an, uh, an F of B by lifting G with, with F by F mapping G with functor F. And that will consume an F of B, but it gives us back not an F of C, but an F of F of C. How are we gonna go from an F of F of C to an F of C? Um, we, we wanna get something that takes an A and goes to an F of C, but instead we've got something that goes from an A, goes to an F, an F, uh, an F of F of C. You know, a list of 
of lists of imps instead of a list of imps. Well, okay. Um, so we need some sort of natural transformation that will let us take an F of, F of C and turn into an F of C, take a list of lists of imps, turn into a list of imps. And of course, that's what um, monads uh, provide. And um, we looked at them through the lens of the Kleisley category early on, where we saw that um, you know we we have this we have this base category uh, where we have functions you know standard functions from A to B say from ints to bools right this might be is even function um, uh, and then from uh, bools to uh, bools to strings saying you know where it says um, uh, in quotes no no my imagination is breaking down true and, and it quotes false. Uh, uh, sorry, folks, uh, that, um, uh, that these are just standard functions between types. And the Kleisley category corresponding to this um, will look the same from the point of view of objects. The objects in the Kleisley category are identical. So we have ints over here in our base category. We have ints over here. We have bools here. We have bools there. But the functions in the Kleisley category, uh, a function from A to B, is actually not uh, a, excuse me, a morphism from A to B is not in fact a function from A's to B's. It's a function from A to a monad uh, applied to, to B. So, so for example, it might be to a maybe of B. Um, so this Kleisley category be for a specific monad, let's say maybe. And so an arrow from A to B over here in the Kleisley category will be implemented as, would be realized as a function from A to maybe a B. And one from B to C would be from uh, a function from B to maybe of C. This is this idea we have here, right? We have, a, we have these functions which aren't just from A to B, but they're embellished with this effect. And that's what the classic category is capturing. This is an embellished function here from A to B. It's something that is like going from A to B, but it, it has some computational effect as characterized by monad T, like a maybe effect. Um, and having, having done that, um, though in the classic category, we can compose these. And uh, we can compose this arrow with this arrow uh, to get this arrow Q. Um, and that will be something going from A to F of C. Um, and so we've composed uh, something from A to maybe a B and with something from B to maybe of C to be something from A to maybe of C. Um, that's what Q is here, it's a, it's a composite. Um, now you may say, well, wait, that doesn't make sense because these arrows can't be lined up because F star produces a maybe a B, it can't, be then just use this as a source for G star. Um, and the answer is, well, remember, when we're defining a category like the Kleisley category, we have the choice of what arrows mean. In this case, we've chosen the arrow from A to B, B mean something that takes an A and returns uh, for monad if T is maybe a maybe a B. Um, that's what we define these arrows to mean. And we could choose what the rules of composition are because in categories, remember, morphisms don't have to be functions. Remember, we have the category where a morphism from A to B means A is less than B, or another one where a morphism from A to B means A divides B. Um, they don't have to be functions uh, from from one to the other. Now, in this case. It is a function, but it's not a function from A to B. It's a function from A to T of B, uh, where T is, is like maybe, maybe a B. So here we can choose the rules of composition. How do we define what composition means for our category? And we are choosing it in a certain way that we can compose these things and specifically using, um, uh, using this ability to to transform an F of F of C into an F of C. So we have this, this Kleisley category and um, using the rules of monads, uh, we can define this with perfect consistency. 
Uh, and this classic category is actually in an adjunction shown here, where we have a left functor going from the base category to the classic category, mapping each object, each object, each function to the corresponding to a to a, a function that's kind of the Kleisley uh, corresponding function to it. So f here is int goes to a version of is int that can return um, maybe uh, of 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 b um, and uh, or you know if we had something from c to d maybe c is um, doubles and maybe d is um, uh, is is uh, ints or something like that, and uh, maybe maybe it's from C to C, and we might map it to uh, a function over here in the Kleisley category, which maps from a C to maybe of doubles or double to maybe of doubles, um, and that might be something like square root, where um, we want to return failure. Um, okay, so this is a Kleisley category. And a very important element of the classic category were these identity morphisms, because by the definition of a category, um, you, if you take an identity morphism and you compose it with any other morphism, you have to get that other morphism back. And that's exactly what these were. These identity morphisms in the classic category were not, I emphasize, were not mapping A to A. They're mapping A, they correspond to A to maybe a pay. Um, and yet, when we compose, it's a particular function that serves as identity there. It's the, the function corresponding to return or unit or pure within the context of uh, monads. So it's a very specific function, not just any old function that goes from you know ints to maybe events, but one which has, um, uh, a guaranteed semantics with respect to comp, uh, to um, composition. In this case, for example, for maybe it'll be just of the value that's provided to it. For lists, the list monad, if t were the list monad, it'll be a singleton list of the value. We take a value and we put that value in the list. Not We don't put any random value in the list. We put that particular value. And that serves as as identity with respect to composition. If we compose it with the rules of composition of the Kleisley category, with respect to any other arrow uh, coming from that, we will um, we'll get back that other arrow. Um, and uh, we saw that in the monad context. And we saw that monads um, could be defined in three different major ways. One could be written in terms of the other uh, or um, implemented in terms of the other. Um, from a Kleisley category perspective, it's nice to deal with these identity arrows, things from A to M of A. Again, this is a particular function to satisfy the rules of the Kleisley category, a particular function to serve as a monad, not one that returns any old willy-nilly M of A. It has to be a very specific one, such that Kleisley composition with it is gives the, the, other, um, the other function back. Uh, and classic composition we can define. So anything from A to T of B or M of B uh, and from B to M of C, we can compose them to get something from A to M of C. Okay, so that's the Kleisley category inspired one. Um, but we saw two others. Um, one which is category theoretic and, and hearts to this notion of monads as, as monoids in this category of endofunctors. And, and with a monoidal flavor, we have this monoidal multiplication or join, mu, where we could take uh, an MMMC, like a list of, of lists, or maybe of maybes, and we can always turn it in a, in a well-defined lawful way into just an MFC something like, for example, list of lists starting into a list. This is like flatten um, for joining these things. We're flattening the list. We're taking a, a, a maybe and we're flattening the maybe. So if we have a, you know, a maybe of a maybe, we can always just, um, if the outer maybe is nothing, we have nothing. If the 
If the outer maybe is just, we use whatever the inner thing is. Um, uh, and uh, and any monad can, can support that. We also have the same designated return value or, or pure or, um, or unit. Um, so this is another way to write it. Um, this is kind of like the identity with respect to multiplication and this is the multiplication mu. Um, going from an M squared to an M uh, where this, you multiply this by any other thing with mu and you get the other thing back. But you know, most common functional programming uh, characterization is probably this one where we have bind. And, and bind um, here uh, has a bit of the flavor of a, you know, of a, a, a classic composition where we've already gone through this first step of mapping the A to an M of B. Um, and so all we have left is we have an M of B and we want to apply this method to it to get an M of C. Um, and this is like flat map. Um, and uh, we will take this function from B to M of C, this effectful computation, apply it to this monadic value and get back a monadic value. Um, so uh, we may have a, a list of ints and we know how to turn ints into, uh, into you know, lists of uh, doubles. Um, and uh, we can use that to render this list of ints into a, a list of doubles. Uh, and uh, bind is, you know, very, um, you know, very widespread in its use uh, together with uh, this return value. And uh, as I said earlier, you could define one in terms of the other. If you have any of these, you could write the others in terms of it. Um, so you could pick, pick your choice, although I should have noted that, um, uh, that at least one of these requires uh, M to be a functor as well. It, it does require it uh, to be defined as a, as a functor uh, additionally. So it has an F map uh, associated with it. Okay, um, so, you know, we saw that these things play nicely together. Um, and uh, here we have, uh, for example, um, mu defined uh, with respect to uh, each of these monads, whoop, um, uh, about what it means, and it plays nicely with eta. Eta is this um, this value for return or pure or or unit, and they play nicely together. So if you have mu applying mu to uh, the results of uh, uh, associated with um, uh, this uh, eta after t or t after eta, um, we if we apply mu to that, we will get back uh, this original list. So if we have t and then we uh, apply eta in that context, we get this thing out. So eta after t, we get uh, a list of lists where this is the only element in it. If we apply T after eta, we, we get something where we are essentially mapping eta over this list and we get a list of singleton lists. And in either case, you take mu applied to those things and you get back the original list. Um, and this is why uh, those two are not independent. You have to define, for example, mu together with eta in a way that's lawful. Um, these have to obey the monad laws, uh, which um, are coming up here. Now, um, we have the same basic picture when it comes to co-monads. So here we want to compose not, not effectful computations, but contextualized computations. We have an F from F of A to, to B. So maybe this is a stream of A to, to B. And this is a stream of, a, of B to C. And we want to get something that's from a stream of A to, uh, to a C. Um, and the question is how to compose them. Uh, and once again, we can come very close by, in this case, working backwards. So we know we need a C. And so we 
we know G can produce the C, we want to see out, so we know G can produce the C. And so if, if G produces a C, how are we going to get this F of B? Well, we can lift uh, F to produce an F of B to feed into G. Great. We, we know we, we have to execute G last to get the C. And so now we have something to feed G in the form of an F of B. But if we lift F, we got an F of B to give to G to feed it. But now we need an not an F of A, but an F of F of A. And so we can get very close, just like we did before. You notice the, the ordering is, is opposite. Here we had F of F of C on the right-hand side. Here we have F of F and A on the left-hand side. We're working backwards instead of working forward. But the same idea is, is true here. And what we're seeking is something that takes an F of A and gives us a C, but we're, we're stuck with something that takes an F and F f of f of a, like a stream of streams of a, and gives us a c. So the question is, well, OK, we have this. Um, um, if, if we know how to do this, can we, can, we do, can we do something that gives us an f of, that takes an f of a and gives it f of c? Um, and uh, to do that, we need a, a way to go from an f of a, if we want to be able to take an f of a and produce a c, we need to take that f of a and somehow produce an f of f of a to because we know how to turn that into a c using exactly uh, these computations. We, we apply uh, lifted of f and then give, it, give the results to g. So we know how to do this using f of f of g alone. Uh, if we can only turn an F of A into an F of F of A will be golden. We, we, can, um, we can take an F of A, produce a, a C. So um, this is what we'd like. We'd like subway, and it's a natural transformation to go from F to F, to F, 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 F um, uh, a stream of streams, um, to go from a stream of A to a stream of streams of A, um, where it has to observe some nice properties. Um, we need a well-defined sense of what's the ID for this composition. Okay, so just like we had the Kleisley category, now we have something called the co Kleisley category. And the co Kleisley category um, plays a, a somewhat similar rule, but it sort of strangely reversed. So in the close co Kleisley category, um, rather than uh, a function from A to B um, being a function which goes from, I'll, I'll, I'll say here, instead of being having a function from B to A, being a function that takes, uh, takes a B and returns a, um, a, a generalized uh, element of A, a, a monadic value applied to A, a T of A. Instead, we have this co-monadic context. So this is something that takes a contextualized value of B, call it W of B, and produces an A. Okay, okay. Um, so so uh, here, this function, f star, corresponds to, so a, uh, a morphism from B to A is implemented in terms of, corresponds to, in the base category, a function from W of B to A, okay, where W is a, is a co-monad. And and this is something that takes a contextualized value of B and turns it into an A. Oh, man. OK. And an identity uh, over here in the co Kleisley category corresponds to something which uh, takes uh, a W of A. So it, it, the identity is a morphism in co Kleisley from A to A. But it corresponds to or it's implemented in terms of a function from W A to A. Um, so like a stream of A's to A's. Uh, and it serves as the identity. That particular function has to be such that when you compose it with Kleisley composition, with any other morphism, you get back that, any other, mor that, that other morphism back. Um, and once again, this is in an adjunction. You notice left and right are reversed here from earlier. Uh, we had left uh, uh, adjoint pointing this way to the left, 
here. Now it's pointing to the right here. Everything is upside down. We have kangaroos instead of deer. Um, uh, or for those listening from Australia, deer instead of kangaroos. Okay, um, beavers instead of platypi. Um, okay, so um, uh, here we have three ways, just like we did with monads, we have three ways of defining co-monads. One is a category theoretic way. It should start to look familiar, but weirdly opposite. Um, uh, with the category theoretic way for monads, just to sort of go back, we had something which uh, took a, um, an M of M of C, like a list of lists of, of, of type C and produced a list. Here we have something that's kind of the opposite. It takes a stream of A and it produces a stream of stream of A's. Um, so it's going from W to WW. Uh, and we have a, for all of three of these, we have the same need to define cone unit or epsilon um, uh, or extract, which basically uh, takes the focus and returns the focus of a given contextualized value. Um, so for a stream, it returns the, the head of the stream. For a grid centered at a point, it returns the value at that point. Um, uh, for a zipper, which has things to our left and things to our right, and a current element, it returns the current element. All of them require that. But the category theoretic way has this kind of duplicate, which has this flavor of a co-algebra um, uh, or a flavor of a co-monoid, where we take a value and, and produce two of them. By contrast, the co Cleisley one involves these compositions. That's just composition of, of for example, um, uh, F uh, in, composed with G. Um, so first doing G and then doing F. Um, and, and that's defined instead of with the fish operator, it's defined with what Bartosz likes to call the bird operator. Um, and, and so we had the fish operator with the kind of fins and the head. And here we have the bird with its wings in the middle. Um, it's kind of like a stork. Um, but uh, more common functional programming characterization would have extend. And here we have um, where before we took a, a generalized value or an elaborated value or a, a value with uh, some um, embellishments uh, and we took a function from A to two embellished values uh, to produce uh, embellished value. Here we take a, a function that can in some sense perform a local computation centered at a given point um, and turn it into a specific value. And we can apply that to a general context sort of globally and get out the mapped context. So we could take this function, which tells us for every focus, how to use the surrounding information to compute what's needed at that point of focus. And we could, we could apply it to all of the context to get back a, an appropriately mapped entire context. Um, uh, it takes, uh, takes this sort of, as Elias Jordan uh, says, this kind of localized computation um, applies it to the entire context uh, to get a, a globally updated um, context. Um, but these, these have to relate to one another in a very well-defined way. And, um, and, and these are things, um, uh, these are things which um, are, uh, are specified by the, the monad laws. Um, um, so sorry, I'm just getting an, an urgent message here. There we go. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, let's let's just I'll just note that once again we can define any of these and define the others in terms of it. And Bartosz in those lectures I asked you to watch, you know, gives definitions for each uh, in terms of the other uh, for for at least three of them. Um, duplicate, for example, uh, this one here can be, if you have extend, it can be defined in terms of that. 
Um, extend can be defined by contrast in terms of duplicate, if you prefer. So if you have this form, we can always uh, define extend. Uh, composition, co composition can be defined in terms of extent. Um, and you'll notice that like this one here um, does require F to be a functor, um, but you know, in, in our discussions, it, it is an endofunctor. It's overlying that is not overly onerous. From a programming perspective, some of these definitions may allow you to dispense with that, the added assumption of having FMAP uh, available. Um, in this case, it is something that, uh, that is needed uh, to apply this. Um, okay, so um, just as before, we had natural transformations from monads. Here we have uh, uh, natural transformations for comonads. And specifically, there we were dealing with join. Like, what is join here? Um, where is it? Uh, there, there it is. Where, what is join for different monads? Uh, for list monads, it takes a list of lists and collapses it to a list. It flattens it. For a maybe monad, I gave you the semantics before. Uh, for a writer monad, it, it appends the strings, uh, if you have strings being carried around, or in general, monoids. Um, for a power set monad, it, it takes the union of all the subsets, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it is with, um, with delta, uh, this duplicate um, here. Uh, duplicate has to work in a certain way to obey the monad laws, uh, the co-monad laws that are coming up. Um, and uh, let's take a look at an example of a stream. So if we have a stream, and I've written this in this arbitrary notation, but if we have a stream that maybe it's an infinite stream and it starts at one and, and then has elements two, three, so on. Um, uh, you know, if, if we have duplicate a find, uh, defined on that, so we, we uh, take delta and it takes a stream and it produces a stream of streams, we have a stream of streams. Um, and, uh, and here, the first element of that stream is just the original stream. It's uh, the original stream that was here is used as the first element of the stream of streams. The second element of the stream though is not any old stream. It can't be the original stream. It has to be a stream starting with the second element. Mm. Um, and, it, and the next one, yeah, it has to be a stream starting with the third element, okay? Now, you may ask why that is. Well, it has to do with the, the co-monad laws that you'll be seeing coming up. Um, it has to be, this has to be lawful in the sense that, you know, have regular structure in the sense that, look, if we take these results and we, we go and lift um, uh, each, uh, we apply epsilon, this extract, excuse me, uh, this extract, um, which extracts the current focus from each of these elements. That's what this is. This is lifting epsilon to apply to each of these elements that resulted from delta. We say extract from the first, and it gives us one. We say extract from the second, it gives us two. Extract from the third, it gives us three. Um, and uh, and that has to give back the original string. That's part of the Comonet laws. And similarly, if we just go in and we say, hey, you know, um, this is a stream. Look at, look at that stream there. Looky that. Um, uh, guai guai long di dong. Um, we, can, we can apply extract to this. Um, uh, then it's going to return the focus of this stream. What is the focus of this outer stream? Well, it's the first element of it. And what is that element? Well, it's one, two, three. And, and that has to be the same as the original stream as well. So there are these co-monad laws that say these have to play nicely together, just as they did with mu and with eta in the context of monads. Um, they have to play nicely together. So delta can't be any old, you know, throw it all down and just, it's, it's some list of lists, um, uh, you know, or, or a stream of streams or whatever. Um, 
No, no, no. It it has to it has to have uh, the flavor that what's produced has values in context where each of those values is kind of what surrounds that point in the stream. So here we have the the first element um, of the stream is the original stream. The second element has the value in context is the second element here and and what follows it. Right, its neighborhood. The third is what follows that. And we have to have each of those in turn. Each of these elements that come out of duplicate is not just any old stream. It's the, the original stream um, with particular points of focus in that original stream and the stream around them. Or similarly, like a grid, if we have a grid and we consider any one position in the grid um, and we uh, duplicate that grid. The, the thing that is going to result is a grid of grids, but it's not going to be any old grid of grids. It's going to be a grid of grid where for, for a given point I and J in that grid, say row J, row I, uh, column J, um, we have the grid around that point I, J. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as what's in that, in that grid. So we have a grid of of these particular grids, each of which is different and centered on a different point, the corresponding point. Same thing with the zipper, as you saw in Elias Jordan's um, uh, talk. You know, you you you'll have a zipper of zippers where each zipper within that outer zipper um, is is kind of centered at a different point. So it's kind of taking the original broad context from all different perspectives or all different positions in it. And the same thing with trees. It's like, you know, you could have a, a tree where each attribute, it's an attributed tree. So every node has a certain value and the result of duplicating it will have that value be a tree, <laughs> the tree at that point um, in the original tree. Um, okay, so these have to, play nicely together. Now, um, we're gonna approach it. So, so these value, these, these, uh, uh, these definitions have to observe some laws. And we're gonna talk about where those laws come from, from two different perspectives. Number one, where they come from in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the comonoid laws. And secondly, where they come from in terms of adjunctions. Um, and uh, just as every get adjunction, the, the, the laws associated with it give rise to uh, the laws associated with monod monads, so it is they give rise to laws associated with uh, comonads. Um, and those laws dictate uh, how, these, uh, how these different um, definitions uh, relate to one another. We can't just satisfy this interface informally. It has to obey these laws. And we'll see what those laws are, but you're getting some flavor of this. Um, this is part of being lawful. Okay, so just to remind us what a natural transformation is. A natural transformation for two functors from category C to category D, call it functor F and call it G, provides for any object in the original category, a way of translating where F mapped that object to, to where G mapped that object to. You'll remember, we saw this for like saying, okay, uh, a natural transformation maps, you know, the mouth of the person to the mouth of a dog or the hand of a person to the hand, to the paw of the dog. Um, and um, that's something which um, needs to be consistent uh, in the sense of how f treats a given function, how f lifts a given function f, and how g lifts a given function f. We can either first convert from f, uh, from how functor a mapped the object, how g mapped the object, and then apply the lifting of the functor f um, to get us to g and b, or we can first um, go uh, apply F to go from uh, F of A to F of B and then convert over to G. Either way needs to be the same, meaning they have to commute. So they, they need to yield the same result. Um, and we saw that 
um, you know, some lectures ago for SAPED, right? Um, if we had lists, um, uh, this will be a valid natural transformation safe head. If we uh, take a list of ints and we can either first ask if it's negative, um, getting a list of bools, and then convert that over to a maybe with safe head. Um, uh, here we're applying is negative to elements of the list in a non in a non lazy language. Uh, alternatively, we could take a list, do safe head on it and get a maybe of, so a list events to be a maybe event. And then we could F map is negative over that maybe to get a maybe a bool. And, you know, in a, in a non-lazy language, this latter one will be more efficient. It, it's not doing it for every element of it. It's first converting it to a maybe and then just doing that rather than mapping over the entire list and then converting over. But for a natural transformation of safe head, this polymorphic function is natural. It needs to obey, obey this. And again, the, the idea of parametric polymorphism by that paper, Theorems for Free, is guaranteed to be a uh, parametric polymorphism is guaranteed to be have a induce a natural transformation. Um, so just as a reminder um, why this is relevant, um, we're going to be seeing natural transformations in spades. And uh, particularly, they're coming out of the context of adjunctions. Um, and um, I'd like to remind you about adjunctions. Uh, we actually saw two definitions of adjunctions, and we're going through each of them because they lend different light on comonads. But an adjunction involves two categories, C and D here, where we have a pair of so-called adjoint functors. Um, so there's an adjoint functor from C to D here, the right functor, and an adjoint functor from D to C here, the left functor. And the arrow, this big misshapen arrow points in the direction of the left functor. Great, great, okay. Um, we could also indicate it with this little turnstile, um, uh, which uh, uh, should, should point in the direction of the, uh, the, left, uh, the left functor. Uh, okay, so um, so this should should actually go to the left. I don't know why it's it's turned upwards. Um, it should be rotated. Um, okay, so um, here we have uh, you know part of the adjunction context. What makes it an adjunction though are a set of adjunction laws, and or a, 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 an adjunction um, uh, sort of invariant which is uh, given down here. Uh, and basically what it's saying is that, uh, that if we consider, and this is a very strong thing, any C and C, the category C, any, cat any object category D, for any object, you pick the objects, I can guarantee for you that um, if we consider the morphisms between R of C, so you specified C. I say, okay, there's an R of C induced by mapping C with R over here. And you get, you already picked a D. And if we consider all the morphisms between those, um, then those are in one to one correspondence with, they're in isomorphism, and in fact, in natural isomorphism with morphisms going from the, the D you picked. Um, we can map it with L and we get LD and, and all the morphisms going to C. Um, so there's this structural similarity between these, this striking structural similarity, uh, which is saying that they're not mirror images of each other. You can have collapsing going down, but, um, but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in these morphisms. Um, and so the morphisms going from LD to C over here in C are in one-to-one -one correspondence with those going from D to RC. Um, so they, they, in some sense, uh, reflect each other as categories. Um, they're not the same. They may collapse things down, but they, um, uh, they have this fundamental kind of invariance and structure. There's this underlying 
uh, systematic similarity between them. Um, okay, so if we have this situation, um, uh, now let's uh, consider where monads and comonads uh, whence they emerge. Okay, here we go. Here we have this. Okay, so we can map over with L to LD. Great. And then we can map that over with R to get RLD. Okay, okay, look at that. Um, so, so here, instead of considering, you know, all these morphisms here to C, we just went to LD and we went directly back with R, because after R, L, after R, all, R is a functor. It maps any object in C over to D. So we can apply it to LD and we'll get RLD. Okay. Now I've conveniently written this here, but it's not the same point. I just was reusing the notation or the, the space rather. Um, okay. So now we have RLD. We have this kind of round trip we've done in back into D, right? We mapped over to C and we map back to D. Great. Now we have RLD. Okay, terrific. Um, so we're back in D. Um, now, the key thing is, this may seem like, well, okay, yeah, so, so what? Well, it's interesting um, because this has a very peculiar property. You notice that this image looks like this image, except it's shrunken. It, it shrunk it down so that LD and C are the same thing, right? It's these two have been reduced to a point. And it's it's LD. C, we've chosen C. After all, we could choose any C, right? We've chosen C to be LD. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so that's interesting. Well, what about it? Well, what's interesting about this is that we know that in a category, any object, any object, ladies and gentlemen, has an identity morphism. So we know there's at least one morphism from LD to itself. Okay, so we know there's at least one morphism. Can't be zero from LD to itself. So these morphisms we've shown here, when C is LD, there's at least one of them, right? There might be others, right? There might be, maybe LD is int and the god awful number of things going from int to int, you know, things that square things, things that multiply things by two, right? But one of them is special. One of them is identity. It, it don't do nothing. It, it just leaves each element unchanged, right? And, and so we know that exists. So what, what we know is there's got to be, since, since these morphisms over here in D are one-to-one -one correspondence with these over in C from LD to itself, there's got to be at least one morphism. There has to be at least one morphism over in D from, from D to RLD, right? Um, so a to D here uh, is this morphism that corresponds to the identity morphism over here in C. Um, by the way, you could think of that in the co Cleisley category. This morphism is the one that corresponds to the identity morphism over here in the adjoint category. Um, this is, is a very special morphism from WA to A that corresponds to the identity over here, plays the role of the identity with respect to composition, just a, a point. So this guy plays this role of kind of the identity uh, over here in the adjoint category. Um, and um, you may ask, well, yeah, okay. Um, um, why do we say this is uh, a natural transformation? Well, um, it is, it's a natural transformation that, that exists for every object here, uh, D, um, there is one of these natural transformations associated with it, uh, that every object um, here is, is, has its mapping to RL of, of that object for this round trip, there's gotta be this, this morphism. So this is a natural transformation. Natural transformation is this mapping that um, between these two functors, these two functors for every object over here in D that comes from an object in C. So, so it's a similar thing here. All these objects that can be reached by C have to have this 
this element of the natural transformation of this component of the natural transformation associated with them. Um, and we could think of this, you may say, why is this a natural transformation? Well, this obviously is, it's RL, um, uh, sure. But this is, uh, th this one doesn't seem to have a functor associated with it. This, remember these are between functors from functor F to functor G we're mapping saying, how does it map A? where A went to. Um, well, uh, yeah, but, but this is identity natural transformation applied to each, each object. Okay, and, and there's a naturality square associated with this um, that, uh, that is associated with it. Now this is, this is for RL, this is for monads, but it turns out that, um, uh, that there's, uh, well, okay, so for monads this induces, this is eta, Eta is a natural transformation that's unit, right? And it, and it can be defined in these sort of ways we saw it last time. So for sets, it's a singleton set. For lists, it's a singleton list. For maybe it's a just. For writer, it's a thing with, if we have string in the first element, or uh, it's a empty string, et cetera. Um, let's go look at how this results for comonoids, or to, for comonoids. Um, okay, so, so we have the same basic situation, same basic relationship, and we can play the same trick, right? Here we, we kind of had this, and guess what? We can play the same game in reverse and have a round trip going over here. So there we go. Okay, now we have a round trip over there. Um, uh, okay, and by the same token, we know there's an identity morphism from RC to RC. So we know that there's at least one morphism from LRC to C. Now you notice the asymmetry here. Um, this is something we emphasized from the start. I mean, these aren't total flips of one another. These things uh, are going from LD to C is the same as D to RC. And so in both cases, as Bartosz puts it, these are raining down. Um, it would be different if one was, you know, this one on the left were flipped upwards, but it's not. And this leads to this flip uh, for comonads um, with epsilon compared to uh, eta. So epsilon here is not from C to RL to LRC. It's from like kind of, as you might expect from monads, it's from LRC to C, okay? And LR is going to be our, our comonad. Uh, so it's WC to C. Um, this is a natural transformation um, that goes from WC to C. Um, and we know that it has to exist because there's at least one morphism over here from RC to, to itself. Uh, so this corresponds to identity over here in D. Um, and it's exactly that in our co category, right? Um, in our co category, this morphism over here in, in C um, uh, corresponded to this morphism over here in C corresponded to this, um, uh, this uh, context um, using morphism uh, over here. Uh, so E star, over in the co category, it was from A to A. Over in the co category, it's from WA to A. Okay, 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 there we go. Um, uh, okay, so uh, here we have this guaranteed to exist. There's a naturality square associated with it um, that's, um, that extends in sort of comparable ways. And we're calling the comonad W was kind of a M upside down. Um, we called monads M often, and we'll call this W. Um, okay, so what do these things look like? Well, just like just like um, uh, unit was pretty easy to define for uh, monads. Uh, eta, or sorry, epsilon. Uh, so so uh, unit for monads was was eta. We have epsilon for comonads, and this turns out to be quite easy to, to return. So if we have a stream, we have the head of the stream, right? If we have a pair here, um, 
of an object with some added information like an environment, we just return the, the first thing in it. If we have an attributed tree where each element is associated with um, a value A, and this tree is rooted at a point which has element A, we return A, associate with it. For a zipper, you know, some traversable with some value, we'll just extract that value and, and, and use that. It's the, va the focus value. This is kind of where it's at, where it's centered at. If we had a grid and it was, um, you know, a grid around a given point, we return the value at that point. Okay. Um, so um, this was one definition of, of, uh, of uh, adjunctions that we made use of that took advantage of this natural isomorphism here. But that wasn't the only definition. Um, uh, and uh, we had seen another one which, which more emphasized similarity in a, in a different way. Um, and um, here uh, we, are, um, we are emphasizing uh, as well, these, this role of eta and epsilon. Um, and, um, okay, this, this is actually Humstead isomorphism. So it's a, it's a, it's a similar, um, similar point. Okay, right. Um, okay, so now I, I want to talk though about this issue that we were discussing, because we've seen eta, we've seen uh, epsilon. Um, eta is unit for monads. Um, it takes a value and, and, and puts it into an embellished value, like takes a value and creates a singleton. So that predictive value and has to be a very special function that preserves those values, but extends them, you know, puts them in this, in this embellishment, um, but it preserves them. It has to act just like the original value for preserving that value. Um, by contrast, um, uh, epsilon is this thing that extracts the focus for a comonad. Um, uh, so we've defined those, but, and that gives us a sense of identity with respect to composition. But in order to implement um, composition for monads, we needed a way to join. We needed a way to collapse down an F of F of C into an, to an F. Um, uh, so a list of lists into a list, for example. That would allow us to straightforwardly map um, over, um, you know, map map this G. If we get back at F of B, we can map G over it uh, and uh, lift it with F and map it. And, and which so F mapping it uh, with functor F will take something that takes an F of B, consumes the results of of this F, and returns. Oh, it returns at F of F of C, and we need to we actually want to return an F of C. We need something that will reduce them. That's what we needed for monads. And we arrived at join, right? Um, and it turns out that you can derive this. So uh, in a very straightforward way for monads, uh, we could derive mu uh, in terms of, so this, this thing to take an F of F of C, like a list of lists and turn it into a list we can define it in terms of um, uh, epsilon and and these 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 functors here um, R and L these these adjoint functors um, and uh, that allowed us to kind of define mu um, this join in a way that guarantees that it will exist if if we know what R L uh, R is and L is, and we have this epsilon induced by the adjunction, we can right away um, um, produce something that maps uh, T after T to T or T squared to T. In other words, reduce the list of lists to a list. So given an adjunction, this is guaranteed to exist. Okay. Uh, and I won't go into the reasoning here, except to say that um, uh, it it reflects the fact that we can take um, take uh, L after R and reduce it to identity. We have a natural transformation eta that does that. 
And so T after T is just R after L after R after L. And we can take these inner two with epsilon and turn them into identity um, using epsilon. And, and this provides us uh, a way to go from, uh, from RL, RL to be to just RL or T, T squared to T. Um, okay, so um, that's because as a functor, this, this thing disappears right here. Um, and we just get R out. Um, uh, and um, we, we saw how with monads, these natural transformations mu, this kind of multiplication was defined, uh, flattening of lists, flattening of maybes, et cetera. Now we have to go through the same thing, but it's flip. We have to deal with the kangaroos. We have to deal with the platypus um, and watch out for its venom uh, here to go from an F to an F of F. Because remember with composition of con context using functions, um, the problem was, was different. We know how to get a C. Uh, it's not the return value that's a problem for, for what we have. Instead, we, we need an F of F of A. And um, we know how to go from an F of F of A to a C, but we wanna be able to go from an F of A to a C. And so if only we can go from an F, of F, an F of A to an F of F of A, we're golden because we could use that by, by appropriate lifting and so on to, um, um, to, to map these because we could go with lift F with functor F to go from an F of F of A to F of B and feed that to our G and get back to C. And so, you know, um, we, we know how to go from um, here from an, um, uh, we, know, we know if we could be given an F of F of A, we know how to get a C. Uh, we have to get an F of A and we need to know how to turn it into an F of F of A. Um, and so we need, a, we need a way of doing this. And fortunately, um, just as we get out mu defined in epsilon, we get out delta defined in terms of eta. Um, and um, I don't know why this is saying that. That's, um, sorry, um, well past my bedtime now. Okay, um, there we go. Um, let's try that again. Um, okay, so um, here, uh, it's kind of neat. Um, remember um, the, uh, the comonad, is L after R. That's what the conon mana is. I mean, we, we call W the results of, of going round. So if we have um, uh, R first and then L, so R first and then L, this is our, this, uh, this LR denotes our comonad and extract goes from the comonad applied to C to C. Okay, that's, that's, that's epsilon, great, great, um, superb. Um, so omega, sorry, omega, a W is L after R. Okay, now um, um, we have uh, coming out of the, the adjunction, this unit, we saw it earlier, uh, eta. And that goes, that's a natural transformation from ID functor to R after L. Um, great. Uh, so given that we have that, if we have LR um, here, we can kind of wedge that in the middle. So if we have uh, LR, well, look, uh, LR is just, and I should have written this out explicitly, uh, uh, L after R, so if we have R, we're over in D, and I should, I should show this here as like this. Um, so we have actually ID of D in the middle, because uh, if we map from our category C, this is where the comonad um, starting point is, and we map over with R, now we're in D. You know, and then we map back with R, we get LR, great. 
but that's the same as kind of going over mapping with an identity fun functor, just stay here, wherever we are, stay, and then map that. And so having done that, um, we could then transform that um, in order to map. I don't know why this is, um, basically Ada is going to allow us to transform this into something where IDD is replaced by RL. And so we get out uh, using, by applying ADA surrounded by L as a, as a uh, identity natural transformation, R as an identity transformation, we get, oh gosh, this is, uh, this is kind of wrapped in a, in a whacked out way. Um, let's, let's just take that, oh man. Um, now we're hurting. Um, okay. Um, okay. So um, we're able to to basically map this over to this thing with this ADA um, uh, as a natural transformation can take this identity functor and turn it into an RL functor. Great. And and this L natural transformation preserves this functor and this R natural transformation preserves this. I've got to, got to, got to write this, um, I've got to write this up in a, in a clear way with uh, the colors here. These should all be, these are all natural transformations here. Um, confusingly written at, with the same letters. Um, there we go. Um, and, uh, if we map this with the natural transformation, uh, we can go from this guy to this guy. So I'll say map with uh, this, this thing. Okay, now we're in trouble. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, map with that um, and, and we got this and that gives us this, which we could express as W and so it's it's like going from W to, we have a natural transformation that can map from W to W composed with W. In other words, W to W squared, which is exactly what we want here. We want to be able to go from F of A to F of F of A, from a stream to a stream of streams. And that's exactly what we have. Great, okay, so what does this look like? Well, we have a stream, we want a stream of streams and we saw what they look like before, right? Uh, for stream, we, we have, the stream of streams has as its first element, the original stream. The second element, the original stream around the point that was the second point in the stream. So uh, with that as its focus and everything after it. Um, the third point in the stream of streams is a stream whose focal point is the third point in the original stream and whose context is everything after it. Um, and you know we have a grid of grid and, and I, I talked about this before. Okay, now um, well, we still have gotten. We've only sort of been waving some hands on on the uh, laws side. Let's let's go look at these. So every adjunction has triangle equalities associated with it. It also has an associativity property, which I'm not showing right here. But um, uh, there's a um, uh, there, there's triangle equalities associated with this adjunction. Um, which uh, play a role in one of the definitions of adjunctions. Um, okay, um, and uh, it turns out that these identity, uh, th these adjunction triangle equalities give directly rise to the monad and comonad, uh, comonad laws um, for, for their triangle laws. Um, so we'll take a look at it. Um, so, for adjunctions, we have these laws, and you could go back and listen to that video to find out, uh, you know, how they um, how they might be um, be defined. But they have to do with the definition of eta and epsilon here. Um, and uh, these uh, these laws uh, associated with adjunction, you could systematically transform them. Uh, here we pre-compose, so compose on the right thing that goes before L. We put it here, we put it here, we put it here. Um, and uh, each of these has this is a natural transformation from this functor to this functor. So we have an identity natural transformation there. And um, by so doing, 
uh, we can start to recognize patterns. So R after L is, is the monad. Uh, RL, RL is monad composed with monad. Uh, this thing is nothing more than mu. Um, and uh, the same thing occurs in kind of the flip way with this triangle equality coming out of the adjunction. So these are the adjunction triangle equalities. Here we kind of just pre-compose or post-compose them with something. And we just map down and we get out the monad triangle laws. Um, that's kind of nice. It turns out the same thing is true with uh, comonad laws. Um, so it's, it's, you just follow your nose. Instead of pre-composing with L, we post-compose with L. Instead of post-composing with R here, we pre-compose with R. And you go through that exercise, you turn the crank, um, and L after R is the comonad. L after R is the comonad. Um, this thing here is, you'll recognize it as um, two comonads in sequence. And you, uh, uh, you, you uh, have here the definition of delta. Um, I don't know why I, this is mumble, mumble uh, nonsense. Um, okay, um, I have to go figure this out at maybe 11 last night. Okay, so uh, great. Um, so here are the Komonad laws and they come out of the, adjunction triangle equalities. It's beautiful. Um, uh, they pop out. And I want to emphasize that, um, you know, what this means here, like this, this equal, this is a big equal sign. And I mean, obviously, this is the same symbol as that, but it's not saying that it's, it's, it's saying something more. This, this gets back to our, um, to our statements earlier about about this sort of thing, that um, that th these have to be the same value. That's what this means. It's not that the, the W symbol is the same as the W symbol. It, it, this wouldn't work if this were still a monad, but it was screwed up in some sort of way. It was a different value than this original one. What this is saying is if you start with a value um, that's a monadic value, a comonadic value, so maybe it's a stream of ints. And you duplicate it, you're going to get a stream of stream events, a particular stream of stream events. And if you go and you um, apply that um, to, uh, to, to apply epsilon to every element of that, you will get back a stream of ints right here that has got to be the same stream as this one. It has to be exactly the same stream, they have exactly the same values in it. Um, that's what this equality means. Not that these just are two streams. No, no, no. It's, it's got to be like this exact original stream. Um, so, so what this is saying is, you know, uh, epsilon and delta have to play nice together. Um, here it's epsilon lifted to apply to each element of delta. Here it's epsilon applying to the whole shebang and extracting the outer element. Remember, epsilon is extract. So here we're extracting each element of the internal thing. So we're taking, you know, each of these, each of these guys and extracting the, the focus for each of them um, uh, for, for this one. By contrast, for this one, um, we are extracting the focus of the outer Outer stream. That's what that's what this guy is. Um, so uh, we're, ex we're extracting the outer sort of the first thing in the stream of streams. The very first stream in that stream of streams becomes the thing we extract, and that's got to also be the same as the original stream. Um, and I, I've kind of drawn it in a, in a different way there. Um, so um, here. You know that's what the equal sign means. Don't don't think it's just like yeah we get a W back. No no it's the W. It is the thing we started with, and so there's this really stiff constraint there, right? Um, about how they have to play nice together. They have to be consistent. They have to be coherent. 
in their definitions. Um, uh, just like was the case with eta and mu, um, you know, we had to get the same value back that we started with, regardless of whether we went, uh, we, we, we lifted uh, eta to apply to each element here. So we created a, we, we applied this, this thing, which created a singleton and of two, a singleton of the next element three, a singleton of the next element five, or whether we just took eta and we said, you know, um, extract the outermost one, two, three, five, boom. Um, we have to get the same thing back. It's the same thing with monads, uh, but now it's true with co-monads. Um, okay, so uh, it turns out that um, the same property um, is used to, to ensure that you know, that if we have a co um category and we compose with eta, we compose with extract, we, we compose any other function with extract, we have to get that other function back. Um, remember that we can define um, the, um, you know, F after G, the co composition of a function f, a, a contextualized function with a function g in this sort of way. Oh man. And um, I've written in this way to avoid getting confused about the ordering. First we duplicate um, uh, and, and, and that uh, takes, um, takes our, our value uh, that we got in uh, wa and turns it into WWA. Um, and then we apply uh, the lifted version of F, which takes in a WWA. Hey, that's great. It's just what's been produced by Delta. It returns a W of B, because this whole thing is lifted. Great, you got a W of B, and guess what? That's what G consumes, and then we get out of C. Because of this, I mean, this thing here guarantees uh, some nice properties um, associated with Delta and associated with lifting and so on. And we're going to, uh, we're going to get uh, this, uh, this nice property uh, associated with uh, composition. So I believe it just falls uh, essentially right out of this. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, now uh, time is running on. So now I wanna talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, Comonoid uh, structure. Now, this part I didn't have time to pin down uh, quite as uh, quite as solidly, so uh, I have to wave my hands here a little bit. But you'll recall that we talked about this notion of monads as as uh, monoids in the category of endofunctals, and um, it's it's a complicated um, uh, thing to understand. But we started. One of the things we started with was a, a notion of a product category. And a product category has, for any object in an original category, the product category of that category was itself, has objects which consist of kind of pairs of, of objects in the original category. And using this, we defined a monoidal category, a, a category equipped with monoidal structure um, by, uh, having a bifunctor, this functor that goes from product category, this pair, oh gosh, to, to an object. So here's a functor that kind of maps from each pairing back to that. So, you know, we have A cross B, whoa, um, it, it, it gets mapped to, where's my A cross B, wherever it is, here it is. Uh, what does it get mapped to, et cetera? There's a, there's a bifunctor that kind of multiplies these two values to get a new new value. And there's a manual unit which kind of picks a value of C. Um, uh, it picks some object in C to serve as kind of the unit. Uh, we multiply it by anything else, we get the same thing. And it has to have these properties. That's a monoidal category. Um, and there's some, some laws that, that have to commute associated with it. We can define a co-monoidal structure uh, in kind of a similar way. Um, a co-monoidal structure has a monoidal product as well. And here we're, 
we're, we're mapping, this is kind of weird, but we're mapping each object into a pair of objects, okay? So instead of going from here to here, like with the monodal category, we're going the reverse direction. Okay, that's, that's, that's wild. Uh, and then there's gotta be a functor from any object to, to this terminal object. We'll get to that in a few lectures. Um, of uh, the terminal object, which is a really neat, neat concept. And it has to have these nice properties, which are just a flip of these properties, okay? So, so this monoidal product goes from C to C cross C, and, and then we could go up to this, and, and they have to commute. They have to, whichever way we go about it, we have to get the same exact thing. Um, okay, um, now we saw before in, from this floor a couple lectures ago, or maybe it was last lecture, um, there was, um, we, we could define a, um, a monoid within a category equipped with mineral structure, okay? So, so we have a category equipped with mineral structure. Then we have a monoid. Okay, now what is this monoid? It's an object. Okay, it's an object in this category. Okay, fine, it's, it's some object in this category that has this monoidal structure. The, ob the, the category has some ability to multiply things and to, it has some unit. And so this, this monoid in it is a particular object that has two morphism. First of all, you need to be able to multiply that object times itself to get back to itself. Any two elements can be combined to generate an N. So to hand wave. Um, second thing is you have to be able to pick an element of M. Um, uh, you pick some element of, of, of M is, is kind of what it feels like. Um, uh, okay, so we, we pick an element of M, which is kind of our uh, identity uh, element. Um, and we saw uh, there's a category of endofunctors. Um, and here, this is a, uh, a category where uh, the objects are functors and the morphisms are natural transformations between these functors. Yeah, okay, fine. And, um, and there's a composition, which is horizontal composition of these natural transformations of these morphisms. Um, and it turns out that we can define monoidal structure. This category has monoidal structure. It has a monoidal product. And what is that monoidal product? It's composition. Uh, okay, okay, it's composition of the functors um, because the objects are functors and we can compose two functors uh, uh, to get back uh, another, another functor. It's an endofunctor, so the functors all go from C to C, so we can compose any with any other. And there's an identity endofunctor. Okay, okay, uh, fine. So this is monoidal structure. You can like combine, you can multiply any two things by, because the two things you're multiplying are functors and we multiply them by composing them, the two functors from C to C. We can compose any functor with any other one. Okay, fine, uh, great. And a monoid here in this category of endofunctors is a, it has a particular morphism uh, going, so, so we'll call this endofunctor T suggestively. And we have to have morphism from T cross T, T composed with T, in other words, to T. Okay, it's a natural transformation. Morphisms are natural transformations in this category. So this is a natural transformation. It's a special natural transformation that goes from T composed with T to T. Oh, uh, that sounds a lot like mu. Yeah, it is, because it is mu. And then there's a, there's got to be some morphism from I, the I object in this category, in this category of endofunctors. There's an identity object. And it's got to be a natural transformation from that identity object to T, because you got to be able to go from the identity object to our monoid. What's our monoid? It's T, it's T, it's, it's our endofunctor, it's our monad. And there's gotta be a, a, a morphism going from I, which is identity functor, 
in this category of endofunctors. It's the identity functor from C to C. Okay. Uh, and there's got to be a morphism from it to T. And that sounds like eta. And it is eta. It's eta. It's, it's just, that's our eta. Okay. Um, and it has to obey these coherence laws. And guess what? These coherence laws are exactly, boy, was I glad to see this late last night. These are like exactly your, your monad laws. Uh, they just come out. They just, you know, um, they just, you, you just follow your nose. It's, it's beautiful. It all works out. Okay, so that's awesome. We saw that before, but what's this co-monoid? <laughs> well, this is even weirder, okay? So so look, it's the same darn category of endofunctors, okay? Um, but we have to define what a co-monoid is. Uh, you thought it was bad to deal with a monoid um, uh, in this category uh, equipped with monoidal structure. But um, here we have, oh gosh, where's our... Uh, we, we should have had a category, should have had a slide of category equipped with comonoidal structure. But basically a, a category equipped with a comonoidal structure um, is, is going to uh, be able to have this uh, for, for, for any objects. We can produce multiplications of those objects, I think. And, um, and there's an identity uh, or there's a unit um, uh, within that. And here with a comonoid in a category with comonoidal structure, you get, um, you have to uh, have uh, two specific morphisms. One from this object, so this is a particular object, uh, call it a, a comonad, uh, from that to that times that. Um, and there's got to be an identity morphism or a morphism from W, not from M, from W, 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 W. Um, here we go, W to this. Okay, 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 fine. Um, uh, so this is a co-monoid. Um, it's kind of the flip around um, of this. Okay, and guess what? Uh, a co-monad is a co-monoid in this category of endofunctors. Again, it's the same category of endofunctors. The monoidal product is 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 a composition of the endofunctors, the functors of the objects, not composition of the natural transformation, which is the more is the morphisms. It's the composition of the functors, which are the objects. Um, and we have to be able to combine any two objects to get another object. Great. Um, a comonoid here, comonoid, uh, is an object in this meeting the following conditions. There's a special morphism. Oh, it says T. No, no, no. It's not a T. It's a W. Come on. Um, get get with the program here. Okay. So it's it's a W. Um, out out black spot. Uh, let's let's just um, get this uh, corrected. There we go. Um, sorry, I uh, should have caught that last night. Um, okay. Great. <clears throat> so there's a special morphism of this sort. Um, uh, and because these are natural transformations, this corresponds to morphism from uh, natural transformation. There's a morphism in this category of endofunctors. That means there's a natural transformation in this category of endofunctors going from comonad, uh, like comonad of A, it's like stream of A to stream of stream of A. Okay. That's just like, it's not, it's not new with Delta. Come on, um, it's, it's Delta, Delta. Uh, where's my cache of, uh, oh man, no, not that. Um, uh, there. Um, so uh, here we have Delta and here we have uh, Ada, um, which is, is used to, to extract. Uh, this is something which goes from this to um, the identity functor. This is the identity functor applied to C. We can map from comonoid, uh, excuse me, comonad applied to C to C we could extract and they have to obey these laws. And these all just pour out. They all, they all just come out of it. They're just like these laws, but with flipped uh, arrows and uh, they, they beautifully arise uh, on account of the, um, this, sh this should not say this, um, 
uh, but they beautifully arise on account of the, uh, the same basic structure with the um, uh, comonoid laws. Um, and these things should all be deleted because these were just the results of, of copy paste and adaptation that was incomplete. Okay, great. Um, so um, what is all this saying? Well, it's saying that you could find the comonad laws in two ways. This actually shows derivation of both the triangle inequalities of comonads as well as the, um, the, um, uh, the associativity property, which uh, was not shown based on adjunctions earlier. Um, okay, so take it, take it uh, as it is. A, a comonad is a comonoid in the category of endofunctors, just like a monad is a, is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Where does this all get us? Well, um, you know, I, I think that um, comonads are um, a very uh, intriguing construct um, that allows us to, um, to deal with uh, neighborhoods and deal with context. Context is central in our modeling. And as the example from Elias Jordan and, and Bartosz's referral to it, Game of Life uh, exhibits, you know, often we have models which depend on context where the evolution of agents, uh, whether it's in cellular automata or, or more generally in agent-based models with networks or whatever, they're, they're in a context. And um, this notion of having a localized computation, which can then be mapped onto the broader space the entire network, the entire grid, um, is a very attractive one. Uh, as we'll see, this is a theme which will follow us uh, shortly in another context as well with algebras and co-algebras, where we'll be seeing once again this theme of kind of defining something in a localized way and having it kind of map out automatically across the broader structure. Um, we're gonna see this with uh, in the context of catamorphisms and anamorphisms, and uh, there'll be duels of one another. But once again, there's this notion of kind of uh, defining just uh, it in its most basic level. And uh, the, the mathematics of the situation, the logic of the situation will play it out across the broader uh, space. Um, comonads are not as well supported. Um, uh, as monads, they're not as well known as monads. Um, and for example, uh, uh, Scala's uh, notation for notation or Haskell's do notation are, are very, very common for composing. Uh, their use is popular for uh, composing monads, but uh, you don't have anything of, of that sophistication with comonads that are built into these languages as a central component. Um, I do think it's an intriguing question about whether they could secure um, broader use and whether the performance advantages would be there. <clears throat> and the game of life example is intriguing, you know, in its uh, potential application, particularly if there are some uh, optimizations that could be uh, performed in a way that would, um, that would minimize the cost associated with them. This idea of you know duplicating duplicating things from different perspectives um, and uh, extracting the current point uh, it's it's quite central to the notion of of contextualized values that you could do the latter and um, there there are cases where the former can be useful um, whether they will be uh, performant at the level we need for effective um, larger scale simulation, I'm, I'm not sure at this point, um, or how soon it will be before those optimizations, those invariants can be spotted, allowing optimizations to be secured. But they offer an intriguing glimpse of, uh, just as monads did for effectful computation, which is a big need in our simulations, these offer you know, um, a wonderful glimpse of um, potential insights that could be secured by formalizing the notion of context and carrying around the notion of context together with values in a way that is at once compositional um, and, uh, and structured and orderly in the form of, um, of, of the semantics of it. 
Okay, so uh, that's all I have uh, for today. A whirlwind tour through co-monads. Um, uh, I'm pondering the topics to take on for next time. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards free monads and co-free co-monad monads um, as a topic for next time. Uh, I'm also eager to get onto algebras and co-algebras. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to sort of ponder that, and um, we will look forward to, um, to having our, our next session in, on one of those two areas. And I'm, I'm, I'm inclined again towards the, the, free, uh, the free monads and, and co monads. But um, very likely that meeting will be uh, in not two weeks' time, but three weeks' time, because I'm teaching a boot camp in two weeks' time. And I'm teaching a, and I'm uh, taking next Tuesday and Wednesday off. Uh, so I don't think I'll be offering this uh, this next week, uh, but um, most likely time is in three weeks time. Um, I will be having some work that I'll be doing next Thursday and Friday, particularly around planning the boot camp um, and, and a handful of meetings. And it's conceivable I'll change my mind, but I kind of like to have a, uh, a weekend where I could uh, focus on on other things. So that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope this was uh, intriguing. I'll see if I can send out the slides and probably recent slides too, because I'm not sure I've been consistent about passing those on. So thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next time and on one-on-one -on -one meetings. Thanks.